Okay, what's up, y'all? I got another tear-out tutorial for you today. This one kind of reminded me of, like, a stompy, drunken sailor, so, uh, it sounds like this. And so I'm going to be going over the sound design and the post-processing and all that, but I'm also going to spend a little bit of time going over bus processing and how to do a quick, um... A couple quick mastering tips and like how to how to kind of slam your stuff out and make it sound good because this one I think is a great example of an idea that sounds pretty good but isn't quite there and I'm gonna give some tips how to like finish it and not give up on an idea before you finish it because like finishing is a skill in its own uh, polishing your sounds is a skill and doing a mastering job that like accentuates your track is a skill so I'm gonna be going over that a little bit so with all the post processing and mastering on it it sounds like this but then without it, it's quite a bit worse. You know, so it's kind of like subdued, it doesn't sound aggressive, it doesn't sound heavy. Um, so I'm going to be giving a couple tips in regards to that. So starting things off with our sound design here, we have a sub layer that's a phase plant patch, a crusty mid bass uh, layer that's also a phase plant, and then this metallic sampled layer. Okay, so starting things off with my crust uh, phase plant patch here, and it is uh, pitched down 36 semitones to kind of center it in the piano roll. And then I have some noise going into it and the complex FM2 wavetable. So the basic sound input sounds like that. The first thing that I did was added a curve here, which is one of the new modules. It's just basically like an LFO that doesn't repeat. Um, just to kind of get into those messier high frequency harmonics that come in on the uh, end of this wavetable here. So then I added a filter to cut out the low end of it and then I added uh, an analog wavetable with the basic sign. So after I got rid of those lows, those messy lows, I added in a clean low. So then I added a distortion after that uh, analog wavetable and that's one thing that you can do to like if you put a clean sub note in and then distort it it'll give a bunch of um, low mid to like mid range frequencies that can help tear out sounds sound more full and less airy so then i added another filter that really cleans the tops out of this because i didn't want it to be too loud and like blast it out and in the like minatory sounding um you know high frequency range and then i also added a pluck a curve onto this filter that is super short. You see this one's only 39 milliseconds compared to the 157 on the uh, wavetable pluck. And then lastly, before we move into our effects here, I have an envelope that's like just gating this, you know? So like there's no sustain. And it's just pulling it down so I have a nice machine gun type sound. So then going to our effects here, we have the lane one, it, uh, I added a delay. Super short length, um, no ping pong, and just mix it halfway. Just to give it like almost a rhythm -y character, I think that distorting that can give some good tear out results. And then I have a non-linear non filter here on metallic mode with a significant amount of drive, which just kind of accents. It just accents the uh, delay there a little bit. So then we have the next thing that I put in here was a, a sine wave distortion with a significant amount of uh, this curve that goes up and then comes back down. And as you can see, that beefs it up a lot. And then um, the next thing that I did was put a filter to sweep the, through those, uh, those low mids that I just beefed up. And then we have a chorus to give it a little bit of width. And as you can see there, that really starts to like give it some, some space that it's in. Uh, and then I have a dynamics module, just kind of taming the uh, taming the very transient part of this and the tail, and then another reverb, or and then a reverb to put it in a space, and you start getting that like tear outy sound. And I know that without any processing, like this doesn't sound too good. But if you can get a start point like this, I promise you, you're gonna end up somewhere that you like. Okay, so running through my post effects, I have an OTT. Gives it a little bit of uh, gain. Next, I have a Fruity Wave Shaper that's kind of like making it a little crunchier. And uh, one of the things that you can do, you see if I turn the mix all the way up, it's very crunchy and it also gets rid of the space on the tail. Uh, one of the things you can do to get that is 
see that gives the space back. If you put a negative curve right here, um, anything that's below this point in the sound gets uh, almost like bit crushed and reduced, and you can do it even heavier by putting one of those in, right? So the next thing that I have is this boost to the 1000 range. Just kind of bringing some, um, bringing some more gain to the more tonal frequencies, right? You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to mess with this that I can't do too much with that's already pretty garbled in the uh, processing chain. Then I take a little bit off the attack and put another distortion with the bit Harmer Bit Crush mod module on there. And we're getting real crusty now. And then finally, just a little bit of cleaning on those low mids. And then uh, I pull the threshold all the way down on a soft clipper just to keep the dynamics in check on that. And our next layer is going to be our sub, and it is very simple. It's the same principle here. We have a phase plant, uh, pitch down, and then an analog oscillator. The only thing that I did in this one was clone the old patch, get rid of everything in it, boost the analog uh, oscillator's level, and I think I gave it a little bit more decay on the tail because having your subs be longer than your um, mid-bass sounds is a good way to like keep stuff punchy. Like I think Akios was the person that really started this wave because people used to just always, um, you would have your sub pump, with your with your um, mid bass, but then Akio started doing like really short, almost like percussive rhythm elements that like the tails were way shorter, but keeping that sub loud, like it still slaps in a club. So I gave it a little more decay on the sub patch, and then I added a pitch drop that just kind of turns it a, almost into a almost percussive uh, and, and gives you a, a sense of like your sub starting. So then going into the post effects here, we have a destructor with the Harmer Cube and abrasive. So my uh, Harmer Cube is kind of just adding distortion and like kind of really pushing the low in there and giving it, see the movement on that is even um, turning it into almost not a, a plain sub sound. And then I add the abrasive patch which the way that this one works is you turn this threshold down and uh, the preamp up mess with those two and it will as the gain passes the th gate threshold it will introduce noise into your sound and then you just mix it with the dry wet knob or the mix knob so i end up with that then i have a pro q3 here boosting the lows and cutting some of those highs off i probably did that after this ott and this is really just stomping the lows. You see, I brought the low band up, turned the time all the way down. And then I have a fruity limiter that this one acts to squish that tail down. And help it be less of a, a big and like controlling all the headroom. It gives space for the other elements in the drop. Then lastly, uh, I don't ever almost use notch filters, but in this one... I wanted to boost the highs, uh, keep the mids, leave mid space for the crust layer, and then boosted the lows a little bit more. So then my last layer here is this dongle layer that sounds like that with no processing. As you can see, I panned it a little bit to the right, and that's just because the sound is uh, naturally to the left a little bit. And then I cut a lot of the length off, as you can see. I, what that sounds like to me is I think I'm crunching a, a can or throwing a can on the ground. Then going into my post effects here. So first I have a Pro Q3. Just kind of accentuating this peak here and giving some some more volume to the high end on that. So then the signal gets sent into this snap heap. Um, and I did another little diagram because people really liked that last time. So I'll explain the diagram first and then we'll go into um, how... The processing works so we have four parallel buses and then a serial bus so the input coming from this eq right here goes separately through it gets copied one two three four times we have one two three four parallel buses and then they all sum together into this single serial bus and then they're sent out into the next effect there so hopefully that makes sense for you um so the first parallel bus Oh, and also, when that split happens, the gain is increased by a good couple dB each time, so I cut the uh, gain on the out to kind of gain stage it and, and keep it at a reasonable, vo reasonable volume. So the first parallel bus is dry. The next one is using the pitch shifter and goes up six semitones, which is the devil's interval. Um, you can look up the music theory stuff on this on your own time, because I'm not an expert in this, but like... 
The Devil's Interval basically just um, tends to add uneasiness, so it's great for tear out. Uh, then I have the next layer, the next, uh, well, it's almost a layer, but the next parallel bus is, is pitch shifted up 18 semitones, so again, an octave and the Devil's Interval. Sounds like that. And then the last um, parallel bus before we sum into the serial bus is going to be a frequency shifter just kind of arbitrarily set to there. So all four of those together sound like this, right? Just almost like a little um, noise soup going on. Very, uh, not atonal, but like dissonant. It's not, it's kind of almost atonal, but it, it, it gives a good dissonance by spreading the frequencies like that. So then I send it through a convolver. And then two resonators to kind of bring some tonality to that dissonance. And that is a good way to like build a layer that's not just like another metal piece on top of some tear out stuff. So then that sends, and don't forget to gain stage right there if you do that trick. Or, I mean, it doesn't really matter, but just the gain stage is on there so you know. And then we have another EQ. This one's cutting the lows out and the highs. It really doesn't seem like it's even doing anything. Um, and then I have uh, just heavy, heavy compression, just bringing some of those peaks down, almost acting like a soft clipper there. And then lastly, boosting those highs to, to match the uh, heaviness that we have in the crust synth. So then our last layer here, you may recognize because it's just a copy of the... Um, sound that I just showed, except it's pitched down five, uh, five, five semitones. And then the second half, it's pitched up by five semitones again. So that was an, uh, that was an intentional, but it just ended up sounding good at that uh, register. So, so then what makes this the drunken type of vibe is I have this master tuning uh, automation that I put onto the um, pitch bend knob for each of these sounds. I don't think I use it on this one. It's on the dongle, it's on the crust, it's on the sub, and then this little piece here is just a clone of the crust that doesn't do anything because it's not on any pieces that move. So with the master tuning automation, all I did here was on the um, one and the two of every new four bars, I just did a different little Right, we have, we start with a down, then we have up, down, and then we have another little up here, and then another up, down that's identical to this one. So it just kind of gives it like a woozy back and forth. It's not really panning at all, but it's like, sounds like somebody drunkenly stumbling around. So a pretty good example of like taking the most basic boring flow. Right, which is just two hits in a succession, and then a couple backing elements, and giving it some life. Also, as a quick tip, I'll say, uh, all I did here was have the first hit start a little bit after the side chain, and that just lets you not miss out on the nice transients that we have on that uh, patch. So after I set up my automation and had my kind of basic flow pattern, um, I went in and did a little mixing and, and extra, extra processing on my elements here. So for the sub, just boosted my noise that I have pumping in there. For the crust, uh, I have an EQ, and all it's doing is just cutting bare, barely anything out of the lows. That's not doing too much. Then I have uh, my dongle here, which does get a little bit of processing on it. So I put a ring modulator, which if I turn this all the way up, it's set on bandpass noise mode. It just it gives a little, bit grit, a little bit of grittiness to it that I probably accentuate. Yeah, very clean, a little noisy, and then I have an OTT, or I'm sorry, then I have an EQ cutting the low noise that's introduced there. Then as you can see here, I routed both my crust and my dongle into another bus processing thing to where I wanted to distort them together and glue them together a little bit. So I added a wave shaper. Just kind of beefing them up a little bit all along the way. Then I cut some, uh, some frequencies here that you might be like, why would you cut that? You boosted that earlier, and the reason is um, it was getting in the way. 
as you can see here, if I go into my dongle, you can see it even better. It was getting in the way of my nice little tonal thing. Oh, I'm glad I looked at this because the dongle, I'm, I'm um, cutting this really dark bottom out of it and then really boosting the highs. So as you can see, after I added this band in, it gives a lot of space for that. And then I boosted the highs again because a lot of, you know, as I showed in the very beginning of this project, it was so subdued and the lows were so much, the mid and, and low mids were so much stronger than the highs. It didn't really even sound like tear out. So then I have my vocal that I put in here. I, I catch no. If y'all recognize that no, then you're a real one. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if there's multiple tracks that it's from, but the one that I know it from is a slapper. I just stole it. Um, then I have my sub is going into the side chain. My crust and dongle go to here, which goes to the side chain. Then my uh, backing rhythm dongle goes to the side chain. And then um, my vocal skips the side chain because it doesn't need to be ducked. So then moving on to my little mastering tips and tricks that I'll give. Um, I had all this together. This is what we ended up with. So the first thing that I did was put an OTT, and typically when I use OTT, the first thing that I do is go in and match those yellow bands um, by bringing these signals up. But in this case, um, I tried it a different way and turned my end gain down to negative 20. Right, just moved that all the way down to there, and then just switched my out gain up to 13 dB. So the only adjustments that I even made to this was turning the depth down and the time down. I didn't have to mess around with the bands. And as you can see, it just fattens it up and glues it together. Right, my different elements sound more, more like they're in one space and less like six different things. The next thing that I did was ran it through a clipper pretty heavy, so this might be a bit louder. So put on my uh, V clip and just push the input into it until the level was high and it was nice and um, sausagey, but also not clipping too hard. Right, that's not too pleasant on the ear. Sorry if you weren't expecting that. And then I have one last trick that I want to show. So I had my vector scope going here. And normally when I look at any uh, stuff of like mastered stuff, mastered and finished um, reference tracks, like Joe B stuff uh, is really good. And I also like to go off of DK stuff, uh, of course, Murata, but like, I think that can be almost, you know, counterproductive if you put a Murata track in, because for me, I'll just end up trying to copy it instead of just paying attention to the elements of it. Um, but I noticed in my vector scope for a lot of the references for them, um, the whole... The uh, whole uh, clipping, as you can see, you know what I'll do? I'll turn my ceiling way down. It would hit the corners, right? So this is measuring uh, the clipper is affecting things that are all the way out in the side channel. And mine was not doing that. So I was like, how can I get a little bit more side information into this track? Um, and I, I will just go ahead and show that if we put a sideband on here, and if I scan through, right, most of my side information is in the highs, and it gets quieter as I go into the lows. So to fix that, what I did was put in a Pro MB and boosted my high band, right, set my high band on there. Um, and just used a expander to where every time that the threshold gets passed, um, it does a quick little boost to my very high end. And then also on this mid band, compress the mids just the tiniest little bit. which it might even sound better without that uh, mid-band compression that I have on there. But just a couple of little quick tips. Um, if you ever work in a track, you don't have to go back and do that to all your channels. You can if you think that there's one that would make the best um, filler for your spectrum there, but uh, you don't have to go through and do that. Sometimes you can just pop the, you know, you could just pop an EQ on the master and boost that way up. So uh, that's going to be it for this one today, y'all. I uh, hope you learned something. Um,
please do all the things that help support the channel like the video uh leave a comment ask questions whatever whatever you want to do and uh, thanks for watching and i will see y'all next time